Okay, welcome back everybody. Sorry about slight technical uh, delay there. So I'm now gonna turn it over to my colleague, Ron Matoyer, who's gonna introduce the panelists for our first panel. Ron is Associate Professor and Associate Dean in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering and Assistant Dean of Diversity and Special Initiatives in the College of Engineering. His research falls under the general area of human-computer interaction with a uh, particular emphasis on information visualization. Ron, thanks very much for being here and agreeing to moderate our first panel. I do not hear Mark. Thanks, Mark. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, as Mark said, uh, my name is Ron Matoyer, and I'm an associate professor of computer science at, uh, here at the University of Notre Dame. Um, and I'm happy to be here today to uh, moderate our first panel. Um, I'd like to get started by briefly introducing our five panelists. Um, I'll tell you who they are uh, and the organization they represent, and then I'll give them a chance to expand a bit. So uh, I'm going to in introduce each one of you. If you could just wave to the audience, that would be fantastic. Um, so we have uh, Sarah Jordan from the Future of Privacy Forum. Sarah, can you hear us? Just keep going. We have Genevieve Freed, uh, a tech fellow for Senator Chris Coons. Next, we have Kevin Boyer uh, from the University of Notre Dame, Computer Science and Engineering. We have Salone Barocas from Microsoft. And finally, we have Sean Berry from SAS, which I believe is pronounced SAS. So uh, welcome uh, to all of you. Hopefully everyone can hear me now. If you can hear me, can you give me a thumbs up? Excellent. Thank you. Um, so uh, I, to get us started, um, I'd like to ask each of you to take two to five minutes to give us your general views on algorithmic bias um, and where your work in particular uh, fits into this domain. Um, so uh, let's get started, and I, I'll, I'll call out uh, each of you uh, by name so we could go around. Um, and let's start with uh, Sean. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Sean Barry, and uh, I come at this from a practitioner's perspective. Um, I am going to share just a few slides. Um, and, and so I'm not a data scientist myself, but I work for a data science company. Um, and we do a tremendous amount of work uh, in this area. The name of the firm is SAS. Uh, we are the largest privately held software company in the world. Um, and our, our core has always been analytics and math and statistics. So again, what I'd like to do is just give you a, a few opening remarks. Um, and again, Kathy, thank you for the, the great keynote presentation. Uh, a lot of really good information and, and very thought provoking ideas there. Um, not to be contrary, Kathy, to what you said, but I'd like to actually start by just giving a, a defense of algorithms to begin with. Um, in the work that, that I do and my company does and, and the teams that I work with do, we, we see algorithms as part of decision making in many aspects of our lives, and there are many good applications for those. Um, and, and so uh, there's always issues, there's no doubt, there's always issues of ethics and technology, but just a few examples that you see here on the screen. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, government finance. Uh, for those of you who may not know, the largest economic crime in the world today is tax fraud and tax evasion. Uh, there are organizations like the U.S. Internal Revenue Service that use algorithms to be able to try to, to, to determine whether or not when somebody files a tax return, is it actually you who is filing that? Or is it somebody who is an identity thief who's gone in and is trying to steal your tax refund? So it's a very good and, and useful use case. Uh, public safety and criminal justice. A real life example, about two weeks ago, I got a, a very impassioned call from a, a person who deals with human trafficking. And she had identified a, uh, a child who she called pre-verbal, who uh, was being the vic victimized by, uh, by pornography. And they had no idea on how to be able to try to identify who this child is. And she was asking about the use of potential facial algorithms and facial recognition technology to see if we could match uh, social media sites uh, with, with the image that they had from this pornographic footage. Um, bottom right-hand side, the environment. Um, in the state of Florida, um, my firm works with, with the state there to try to predict the risk of environmental damage to the 66 hundred different waterways and water bodies that are in the in the state of Florida. So I want to start by just saying that there are many good uses always with ethical concerns and ethical questions, uh, but I want to give the positive side of that. Two other really quick ideas. 
I want to give you a sense that algorithms um, are not some mystical creature. There are many different types of algorithms that are out there, and they range from very simplistic, as you can see in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, of just simple reports and drill downs, um, to, to more sophisticated types of things such as anomaly detection or forecasting or some of the things that Kathy talked about, uh, the predictive modeling. Uh, there's many different types of algorithms. And I think that it, we should take this into account as we start to think about the ethics of the various types of, uh, of algorithms and their applications that are out there. One final note in my opening uh, remarks here is that there's a process that data scientists use to develop algorithms. And I think that this process could be instructive to our conversation today. I'll go over it ever so briefly, um, and, and I think it'll be important for us as we go forward. The first is in the center of the diagram, you see ask. Kathy did a great job of, of framing and saying, sometimes maybe our data scientists don't ask the right question or they're asking a question that they don't really understand what they're asking. So it's the, that fundamental premise of starting with what is the question that you're asking of the data to try to tell you. That has to be right, that is the foundation. From there, as you proceed to the upper left, you then have to prepare data and obtain data to be able to ask that question. You explore the data and you try to determine what is the data that's there, what quality it is in, what, excuse me, what quality is it in? Dirty little secret, most of the data that any data scientist gets is pretty bad shape. It is never perfect. And so understanding the, the advantages and the disadvantages of that data can be very important. Then there's the process of building and testing a model to determine uh, things like lift and, and how efficient it is. There's then implementing those algorithms, acting on it. Again, a very key aspect of what Kathy talked about is that how is it that we as human beings act on the results of those algorithms? Um, I would suggest that algorithms should not be deterministic, but they should be part of a decision-making process that a human being makes. And then there's the evaluation step. So this type of practical application of and, and process of how data scientists work, I think can be instructive in our discussion today. So with that, those are my opening remarks. Thank you. Sarah. Great, good afternoon, y'all. So I am Sarah Jordan and I'm a representative from the Future Privacy Forum where I'm a policy council for artificial intelligence and ethics. Um, what I wanted to talk about today was to stake a position on understanding bias in AI and stake a position on how it is that we might mitigate this in the future. So my position, and this is gonna echo some of the things that Sean just said, is that oftentimes data is messy. In fact, all the time data is messy, and that's a consequence of history. And we can't rewrite history to make better data however much we wish that we could. It's a consequence of political decisions. It's a consequence of methodological choices that we can't undo, however much magical thinking we want to have about it. However, Mitigation of bias in the future is also going to require some of the same political decisions, better political decisions we might hope, and methodological decisions, better methodological decisions, maybe those that challenge some of the assumption that increasing complexity increases um, the business value of analytics, which I think was just presented in some of the previous slides. But in those political decisions, we're going to have to ask important questions that we may not necessarily want to confront, such as how do we fund? the mitigation of bias in AI. Who funds that? When do we fund it? And how do we fund it? I think that there's some important questions that we can ask about how we may want to approach the, the answers to addressing and to mitigating bias in AI. And there's really two approaches, which you know, for those of you who are on the ethics side, for those of you who are on the social science side, you'll recognize these names. I think we can either approach this from a Max Weber perspective or John Rawls perspective. Either mitigating bias in AI is going to be the slow, boring of hard boards. It's going to be political. It's going to require its passion. It's going to require perspective. But ultimately, it's going to be a hard task with a lot of unsexy dimensions to it. 
the other side of it, maybe more of a John Rawls, more different principles based approach, where what we're trying to do is to identify how can we make AI and how can we make the future of AI and machine learning really be to the greatest benefit of the least advantaged members of society, really take up that second part of the difference principle as our mantra for what we hope to do for um, de-biasing or mitigating bias in AI. I don't think that we can ever successfully achieve a non-biased perspective because ultimately it's down to political choices, to methodological choices that just have all of the dirtiness of human um, life involved in them, hence data always being something that's a bit dirty. So if we take a bo slow boring of hard boards or Bavarian perspective, well, one of the things we're gonna to have to do is address the fact that some of the data that we already use is just pregnant with all of the problems that we know comes into the accumulation of data. We're gonna to have to revisit gaps in the social sciences. We're gonna to have to understand that psychology research that was done on a whole huge crop of undergraduates in large universities in the United States may somehow be incomplete. And we're gonna to have to go back and figure out how to fund and fix that. Unfortunately, though, correcting the research record is going to be slow, it's going to be boring, and it's not particularly sexy. However, it is necessary if we want to address the training data side um, or the data side of machine learning bias. Similarly, if we take a more Rawlsian or difference pr principle perspective, well, we're going to have to challenge that problem of where's the justice and where is the liberality in terms of the data that we have. How are gonna, we going to mind and mend the gaps in benchmark training data sets, um, benchmark analyses, how are we gonna challenge the state of the art to not only be performance, but also in terms of ethical state of the art. We're gonna to have to challenge some of the assumptions that come with the construction of data. As Sean just said, right, analytics is a huge business, but it's not always clear that everyone gets equal credit for what they do. Creating conditions where people can have adequate credit for fixing data, not just creating de novo data, may be something that we have to do. And finally, we're going to have to identify and challenge our beliefs that say that perhaps instead of AI serving the good of all equally, maybe we do have to take a more targeted approach where we do take that Rawlsian difference principle perspective and say, we're doing this for the benefit of the least advantaged members of society first. So with that, I'll go ahead and pass this back over to Eric, and thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, let's go next to uh, Salome. Hi, folks. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. I'm Salome Brokus, I'm uh, assistant professor at Cornell and a researcher at Microsoft Research. Um, so I've been working on this topic for quite some time, almost probably a decade now. Um, it's very nice to see Kathy. It's like you know, one of these people early on who I was able to have conversations with. And so I'm really glad to see how much this, this conversation has expanded. Um, so in some prior work uh, with Andrew Selps, who's a legal scholar, um, we tried to kind of give a survey of some of the sources of bias. And many of those have been touched on already. Um, so I won't necessarily repeat that, except to say that um, many of these issues are quite subtle. It's not just about the representativeness of the data or the fact that past decisions might encode some past bias. Certain data also might be less informative for certain parts of the population. So even if there's no particular bias in the sample or the decisions are accurate, we still just might do a worse job in evaluating some people. And so this list is long. If we really want to kind of be precise about the technical origins of some of these problems, there's many, many more. But I won't focus on those exactly uh, because I want to kind of step back and ask uh, a kind of more fundamental question, which is what is the bias introduced by sort of approaching problems as prediction problems? Um, and so I think this has become very clear if, if we think about some specific context. So I'll, I'll focus on employment and, in, and credit. Um, when we use machine learning to automate hiring decisions, uh, which is increasingly common, um, it actually forces us to be very precise about the specific quality we want to predict in order to decide who to hire, or for, in this case, let's say, who to kind of invite in for an interview. Um, and this is actually required of the process, right? Like you can't be hand wavy about this. We can't say we want the best candidate. We actually have to choose something very specific uh, that is measurable. And in practice, what this often means is that we choose something that is available to hand, that is convenient. Um, and so maybe unsurprisingly, companies will often choose things like <clears throat> some performance metric that they have if they're in their existing review process, right? So uh, among the employees that they've had in the past, how have these people performed in their annual review? 
Um, or you might think, how have these people performed when it comes to their annual sales or whatever it might be. And, and here, it really requires that we make some specific choice. Um, and what we actually choose as the target of our prediction can put us on a completely different path for who we then end up seeing as being a, a kind of appropriate candidate for the job. Um, so, um, you know, some story very early on, uh, which I think Kathy actually also talks about maybe in her book, but I can't remember, is uh, using predicted tenure as a target for prediction, meaning how long is someone likely to stay on the job if we hire them? And this could be a very reasonable thing for businesses to kind of focus on if there is high turnover as there is in jobs like call centers, where, which is one place this has been adopted. Um, but note what you already kind of set yourself on, the path you already set yourself on when you choose to predict tenure as a way to decide who to hire. This is not saying that you're selecting the people who are sort of most qualified in the sense that they would be able to handle calls as efficiently as possible, or that the customers they interact with would report that they have had a good experience. This is simply choosing one very, very specific dimension to evaluate candidates on. Um, and so you've already kind of skewed the process to favor that um, uh, kind of above every other quality that you might consider important uh, to evaluating the qualifications of candidates. Um, and this is true throughout uh, the kind of areas where machine learning has been adopted. So credit scoring, which is a comparatively much more entrenched, much more longstanding practice, has similar questions, right? So you might think that it's self-evident that what we're trying to do when making credit decisions is predict defaults, right? Who is actually not going to pay back their loan? But even default itself is not well specified. What does it mean to default? I mean, this is not meant to be the kind of like existential question. What I actually mean is like someone needs to decide that there's a specific amount of time past which like you fail to pay bills that actually constitutes default. And interestingly, regulators themselves have explored whether different choices about this time horizon actually lead to different allocations of credit decisions. Meaning if you set, set a very short window, like you, you're in errors for maybe, you know, two months, uh, you're going to think that like many uh, people are going to default. But if you set a slightly longer window, suddenly a much larger part of the population seems credit worthy. And again, what I'm trying to emphasize here is that like by focusing uh, on these data questions, we sometimes forget what we kind of already set ourselves up to do by specifying the target in these particular ways. Um, and I'll just add as a final point um, that if we also then begin to think about the question we're trying to answer with this prediction, we can also then immediately ask, I think more more kind of fundamental questions too about like the normative acceptability of certain predictions in the first place, right? So, is it reasonable to try to infer someone's sexual orientation from their appearance, right? Like that's not a biased question that comes from the data. That's a more basic question about whether we think that question is even legitimate in the first place. And so, I want to kind of encourage us to kind of uh, move just past this uh, concern with data and understand that even the questions we're asking in the first place can be something to focus on too. Thanks. Thanks, Alon. Uh, let's go next to uh, Genevieve. Uh, hi, everyone. These are all very hard acts to follow, but uh, I'm glad I didn't have to do four at just three individuals. Um, so thank you to the organizers for organizing this amazing event. Uh, to my team, fellow uh, panelists, it's, it's great to be here with you all. Uh, my name is Genevieve. I am a fellow in Senator Chris Coons's office. Uh, he's a senator from Delaware. I assist with and handle his tech policy work. Uh, I do need to start off very quickly with the disclaimer that the views I express here today do not necessarily represent those of my colleagues or the senator that I represent. Um, but um, so I, I am here in a personal capacity purely, uh, but I will say that Senator Coons is passionate about the intersection of liberties and rights and technology um, and the issue of algorithmic bias is something he is concerned about and we are thinking through um, sort of what types of policy solutions there could be to this type of issue. Um, so with that obligatory disclaimer aside, um, you know, I think increasingly, thankfully, um, people are coming around to the understanding that um, algorithmic systems are not objective decision makers. Rather, they encode biases and produce bias outcomes in myriad ways that we will get to over the course of this talk, um, this panel. Um, you know, I don't think algorithms are inherently evil or that they don't have a place in society. Uh, certainly bias exists in the analog world, but the deployment of algorithmic systems makes it a lot harder to detect that bias. And we have to think very hard about how to deploy algorithms in a way that is thoughtful, socially beneficial and accountable. Those are all very complex uh, notions, obviously. Um, in terms of where, you know, this kind of fits into my work, um, 
I used to work at an institute called AI Now Institute. I was very familiar with some of your uh, the research of the panelists today. Um, and you know, frankly, like academics have known about the problem of algorithmic bias for decades, for tens of years. Um, and obviously, the media has picked up on it a lot over the past few years to the point that it's on a lot of people's radar, um, including Congress's. And um, a primary issue is that no one, not even the government, fully understands the extent and scope of algorithmic deployment. Um, so this is step number one. We need to know where algorithm, algorithmic systems are being deployed, um, what they purport to do in the world, what they actually do. Um, what we do know is that a lot of models being used today are opaque and uncontestable and largely unregulated. Um, and you know, one of the sort of more interesting um, and also encouraging developments I've observed policy-wise um, has been the shift away from placing responsibility um, on consumers and individuals to protect themselves against harmful algorithmic bias and, and other harms that arise from the use of algorithms um, to re placing responsibility in institutions and bodies that actually have the resources and expertise and frankly, the oversight power to go under the hood take stock of what's going on, um, study a system's impact, and potentially make an assessment about whether the risk posed by the algorithmic system outweigh the benefits um, in certain contexts or applications and should therefore be uh, safeguarded against or prescribed in the way that um, Solon you know, uh, pointed out. We have to ask these more fundamental questions are, of are certain applications of these technologies socially beneficial, if not blatantly, unlawfully, um, you know, discriminatory. Um, but obviously, I say that last part, I bracket that last part with great sensitivity because who gets to make the decision about whether a system is socially appropriate, um, whether its bias is harmful, um, especially if the system is not overtly discriminating against a protected status, um, but may be still inducing an unfair outcome is politically and socially contentious. I personally think um, people who are directly impacted by an algorithmic decision should have a primary seat at the table. Um, but what bodies like, what I, in my opinion, what I think bodies like Congress can do is provide the access and, and transparency and oversight that's so desperately needed um, and provide an avenue for ethics to be debate, debated in the democratic arena for, you know, the decision about where to place certain, certain thresholds or, um, or, you know, when to, when to set the default, um, you know, time length. Um, so I think about that a lot in my work, you know, basically what are the best approaches to enable and empower people on the ground to understand algorithmic bias um, and to exercise their rights to protect themselves or hopefully to prevent the need for them to do so in the first place. Thank you. Thanks, Genevieve. Uh, and now we'll go to our uh, final panelist, Kevin Boyer. Hi there. I'm uh, Kevin Boyer, and I am the Shubmill Prine Professor of Computer Science and Engineering here at Notre Dame. So I, I guess I'm, uh, for this panel's purposes, holding down the hardcore algorithms kind of uh, viewpoint. And uh, I should give a shout out to June Prine if she's anywhere in the audience. Um, Ed and June established the uh, professorship that I hold uh, somewhat before I came to Notre Dame. So are my slides showing? Yes. Ah. There's a substantial lag between when I'm touching something that's happening. So um, I've been working for 20 years in the area of biometrics, uh, face recognition, um, fingerprint, gait, iris, all sorts of things. Motivated uh, because shortly after I came to Notre Dame in fall of 2001, 9-11 happened, and that sort of changed a lot of the funding patterns for research in our, um, in our government and uh, opened up opportunities that have been a lot of fun. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and so uh, two of the things that, that we're working on most recently, um, one is understanding the accuracy differences for different demographic groups for current state-of-the-art face recognition algorithms. So is the accuracy lower for women than men? If so, why? Is the accuracy lower for some races than others? If so, why? And we're beginning to make progress on understanding that. One of my 
uh, comments on a lot of the media coverage is that until there's an understanding of why things happen, it's hard to, it should be hard to pin blame for uh, who's responsible or what is responsible. And the bias may be a number of places, the algorithm being one of them. Uh, a more recent paper actually earlier this year um, came about with some colleagues uh, at Notre Dame and elsewhere as we reacted to um, the idea that you could predict uh, criminality from someone's face image. Solon mentioned earlier the idea that you could predict sexual orientation from someone's face image. That's, I guess, equally controversial. There's been a, a small crop of research both on that topic and the, on this idea of being able to predict criminality from face. Our, our take on this was that this is a task doomed to failure, that it cannot be done, that the problem is not well defined enough for it to be done, and that the illusion here is that you could solve the problem. And for the people who've published papers with claiming very high accuracy on doing this, it's essentially a, set, a data set bias where they have fooled themselves into thinking they've done something that they really have not done. Those two aside, the, the, the danger to society is that uh, competent researchers will pursue something that's uh, dangerous to pursue and that there could be uh, very negative consequences for individuals and for societies if uh, leadership were to believe that you actually could do this. So, and I think this has come up, uh, the ability to sell yourself on this has, has come up partly because we have uh, deep learning neural network algorithms where they can find distinctions that you didn't intend for them to find. And I, um, I forget which of the earlier speakers talked about mapping your question onto the data and understanding if the data is actually corresponding to your question. So the people who are fooling themselves to thinking they're doing criminality from face are really just figuring out uh, the two different sets of images were acquired in different ways. And they think they've learned something they really have not learned. Uh, so there's a, there's a danger there because you wanted that solution and you might go on and try to find that. Uh, there's there's a, a huge collection of uh, news articles that talk about face recognition as being uh, racist and sexist. And, and the one on top here is sort of my, my least favorite or my most... Uh, my, my choice for extreme clickbait um, is just getting you to, to click on to that. Um, if, if I hear bias, I usually understand it to mean unequal accuracy, or I understand that someone has observed unequal accuracy and chosen to label that as biased. So that's what we've got here. So if women had 75% accuracy on face recognition and men had 90, it, it's a mistake already to say, accuracy because there's two different error metrics that have to trade off but we'll come to that the one there's three different ways you could make three different ways at least that you could make the accuracy equivalent between men and women the simplest if you hired a high-priced computer science consultant is to if the person's a male generate the wrong answer a little more frequently automatically and you could reduce the male accuracy to the female accuracy i would regard this avenue as satisfying the desire for for um, equal, but as failure, right? We haven't done anything for anybody if that's how we change the technology. If we try to meet in the middle and trade off some decrease in accuracy on men for some increase in accuracy on women, we might get the two to be equal. That would be an acceptable solution, but not what we would strive for. I think as people coming from algorithms, we would want to create a solution that comes from a deep understanding, deep not in neural networks, deep in human minds, understanding of what's going on and be able to bring the accuracy for the previously least advantaged group up to the accuracy of the most advantaged group. And so I would, I would hold out this uh, avenue as the, the, the desired, this as the acceptable, and this as sort of the failure of of attempting to make things better. And with that, I probably staked out enough and I'll stop and give it back to Ron. 
Um, so that's, that's great. Thank you all for, for those opening statements. Um, now we're going to get into a few questions that dig a little deeper into some of the topics that um, you've each brought up in your, in your openings uh, to some degree. So uh, let's get to our first question. Um, as we know, bias is a term that can be interpreted uh, in many ways and has become quite convoluted uh, in the more broad discussion of AI and technology uh, in general. So my first question is this. When we talk about algorithmic bias, what does it mean to you in particular? And so uh, uh, let's, let's start off uh, this one with uh, uh, Salone, please. Yeah, I think I can build off what Kevin was saying. So I think like one natural way to understand bias is that there's a difference in the accuracy of these models. Um, and much of the work that's happened within computer science over the past few years has focused on that. Um, another is to think that there is a difference in outcome that's not justified. Um, so it's not that there's a difference in accuracy, but instead when we apply these models, for example, employment or credit decisions, that different groups end up with different rates of acceptance, um, but for reasons that we don't feel are justified. Um, and then to kind of come back to a point that I made in my opening remarks, um, we might also think that the question that is being posed is being operationalized in the model in a way that's not really faithful to the original concerns, right? So maybe we're getting answers that are sort of technically correct, but they're not really responsive to the concern we have in mind, right? So like, it's not really helping to advance the interest of the employers. It's not really doing very much to make it possible for different people to succeed in the workplace and so on. Um, and, you know, to me, all three of these are very natural ways to think of things, but it's by no means exhaustive. There's many other ways to conceive of it. Um, my concern is that we can often get stuck on the first one. We think of bias only as <laughs> there being differences in the accuracy. Um, and I think we need to make sure that we think more broadly than that. Great. Would anyone, anyone like to follow that up? Yeah, sure. This is Sean. Just to, uh, to, to build on uh, Solon's remarks there, I would certainly agree that the, the, the bias can be certainly in the question that you're asking. Um, and I know much of what Kathy focused on in her presentation earlier tended to be the cultural and the social and the economic biases. And there's no question that that is a very significant form of bias. Uh, but to Solon's point, you can certainly have technical bias. It can be in the, the, the data uh, or the lack of data. I think that's also an interesting idea is you can have bias as a result of not having data on somebody or some action. Um, but, but it's also historical bias. If you're building a predictive model, as Solon mentioned, you're basically going back to old data, historical data to say, well, is the pattern that happened in the past going to repeat itself in the present or in the future? And that could be a good thing. But if you've got embedded biases in that historical data, that could be a very bad thing. So the, the, the data itself and the history can also be a very significant source of bias. Thanks, Sean. I, anyone else want to jump in on this question? Genevieve? Can I jump in for a second? Absolutely. I'm not, I can't actually see who's speaking right now. So, oh, okay. This is Kathy. Oh, go ahead, Kathy. Um, sure. I, I've been allowed to, to lurk. I hope that's okay <laughs> with everyone. I just want to add that like, I, yeah, I think bias is like a very loose term. Um, and I, I prefer, I, I, I don't mind talking. It's like fairness, fairness and bias. Like, mm -hmm. what do you mean by that? You know, it, it doesn't make any sense until you are really specific, but I'll just throw in another example of, uh, uh, in my talk, I spoke about the, the teachers who are being arbitrarily punished or fired or sometimes given bonuses, depending on this uh, random number generator uh, called the value added model. There's bias there too, because it wasn't applied consistently across the country. Like it was only applied to teachers in urban school districts for the most part. Um, so it's, that is a question of sort of like, that's a sort of almost super question it's a meta question about how the how the um algorithm works in in its context and so the question is like what is the category uh you know in some sense it wasn't at all biased because it's a random number generator you could say that's the fairest possible algorithm for scoring uh because it's random but if it's only applied and only uses punishment for inner city schools then it is in the category of all teachers extremely <laughs> punitive for those folks who are happened to be in that in that wrong school district and in, in people in suburbs did not have to worry about it. So that's a different kind of bias that is kind of a more more overhead. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, Kevin, you want to weigh in? 
Yeah, I think if, 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 if that's okay with you. Absolutely. Uh, can everybody see this uh, Michigan State Police Investigative Lead Report? Yes. Okay, good, good. So I'm, I guess I'm going to agree with Solon before I, I disagree. <laughs> um, that that the uh, when I when I hear people talk about bias, I do think they're generally thinking about error rate. Um, and Solon made the point that well, equal error rate may not be the right thing for groups of people. So uh, African Americans may feel that a stop by a policeman that wasn't justified is much more threatening to them than Caucasians, for example, right? And they may have data to support that. Uh, this investigative lead report um, is the uh, sort of seed item for a, a, new, a series of news articles that came out of the Detroit metro area recently. This uh, image labeled the probe image was taken as a surveillance camera image uh, Detroit Metro Police gave it to Michigan State Police and got back an investigative lead. Across the top, it pretty clearly says this is an investigative lead. You have to have more information to actually arrest this person. Well, the person did get arrested. They, they aren't the match. They didn't commit the crime, but they spent a day in jail before they were apologized to and, and released. And the further investigation that was done is that this picture, the probe image, and this picture, the investigative lead, were shown to a security person at the store who was not there when the shoplifting occurred and <laughs> asked in some manner that we don't have access to now after the fact, are these two maybe the same person or the same person? And they agreed that they were or they maybe were. And that was the basis for this person being arrested uh and having their their life disrupted so i think the impact of the possible false matches uh is different for different people so i'm agreeing with solon but i i think the the problem here was not in the algorithm which i believe did exactly what it was supposed to do it was in the use of the algorithm's information incorrectly even though it's clearly labeled on the top by the people consuming the response from the algorithm. Thanks, Kevin. I'll stop. So, so uh, let, let's see if, uh, does Genevieve or, or um, uh, have, or have any, Sarah have anything to add? Sorry. I thought that yeah, might I can, be oh. enough that somebody would reply. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I think this point about, um, you know, maybe contradictions or um, conflicts in terms of nomenclature around bias is very relevant. I used to, to be a technical researcher. So for a long time, you know, algorithmic bias meant, you know, errors in estimation that like results when some members of the population are more likely to be samples than others. Um, but, you know, as I've moved into policy work, um, as we've seen that like algorithmic decision systems um, are increasingly, you know, pervading our lives in, in increasingly consequential ways, um, being used to determine access to life opportunities, uh, such as healthcare, education, and employment, I think the social and legal understandings of algorithmic bias have become much more helpful from a policy perspective um, when trying to create um, and like interventions and, and other guardrails to mitigate or protect against algorithmic bias. Um, you know, I agree that algorithmic bias is not just residing within the algorithm. You have to kind of survey the entire kind of like pipeline um, from ideation to creation to deployment to actual use, the sort of like human computer interaction. Um, but um, I think to Solon's point, um, you know, I, I do like. I do like uh, you know, Dennis uh, D. Hirsch, who's a professor at, at law at Morris College of Law, has a great law review in which he kind of discusses how the privacy and discriminatory harms arising from algorithms are not always clear. Um, so for example, if you have like a predictive analytic system that predicts which individuals um, might be more likely to contract adult onset diabetes, and then a lender denies loans to those individuals on that basis, it might not be unlawful but could certainly seem harmful, especially as you're, you're penalizing people who haven't yet developed the disease because they were taking preventative measures. Um, so I, in some, I sort of think like, you know, algorithms are inherently discriminating. Um, it's what they do, but 
algorithmic bias for me kind of describes a process in which a, a system is discriminating in a way that is socially un inappropriate or undesirable. Um, and the assessment of whether a particular form of algorithmic bias is uh, the assessment of whether that particular form of algorithmic uh, deployment is uh, inappropriate or unfair is one that um, you know impacted communities should be making, governmental agencies should be making, and and potentially even companies uh, providing they have the right incentives. Thanks, Genevieve. I'll add something. Sarah, you here. get the last word. Um, yeah, so something to reflect on what Solom was saying. Um, I think the question about bias is when is inaccuracy justified, right? Justifiably inaccurate outcomes for something may in fact be something that we can explain. We can say, why did we get a difference? Why is there a delta to begin with? But I think going to something that Genevieve was talking about and something that brings in what Kevin was addressing is that where do we get, where do we find ourselves to be upset about bias? And I think we can actually turn to philosophy and we can turn to areas that people continue, often consider to be murky waters to find a way to navigate the understanding of bias. And think about, for example, the idea of luck egalitarianism or egalitarian philosophy. What we really seem to be concerned about in terms of bias is when our brute luck or, right, how you're born, where you're born, your race, your gender, et cetera, when that, those brute luck um, factors are what predict your, the outcome that you receive. Our option luck factors, what we do, are those things that we become very upset about, um, but we tend to be a little bit willing to, or are more willing to allow to slide. Yes, I mean, when we think about the uh, controversy around the use of, uh, they said algorithms, but I'm pretty sure it was just a really great statistical model, right, for predicting A-level scores in the United Kingdom. Um, that's, an, that's an option luck problem. How people choose to behave in an educational setting that helps to determine their test scores, that op that, that's option luck. It was when brute luck came to be involved. Where you live your zip code, your postcode, that people were very upset about the use of algorithms and then very upset about the introduction of potential algorithmic bias. And I think maybe we need to be careful about how we think about the relationship between bias, fairness, luck, and equality as a way to really navigate what it is that we mean by this term and help us to understand how to address this in the AI situation. Thanks, Sarah. So we are getting a little short on time, so I'm going to jump to, um, I think, the third question, because I believe we've, we've talked a bit about um, not just bias, but some of the sources of bias. Um, and, and so we, we know now what, what bias is, or at least it, how each of you see bias, um, and how it might manifest itself in computational algorithms. Uh, so can, let's turn to specific application context. So um, where do you see algorithmic, algorithmic biases presenting a problem and what do you see as the most critical areas of concern? So like, what keeps you up at night when you're thinking about algorithmic bias? Who wants to start us off? All right, I will. Add something. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Sarah. Sure. So if I were to pick one area that I think it would keep me up at night is the use of ambient charting systems in healthcare that rely on speech to text systems that may not perform particularly well for different forms of accents, um, accented English, or don't necessarily well capture the differences between um, female voices and male voices, particularly with some of the accents that are involved there or don't necessarily track the difference between um, patient speech and physician speech, understanding how people call medications and how they call conditions. Um, I think that there's a training um, data problem there, but there's also a problem in terms of um, adjusting the inputs of speech um, to, to text there. Thanks. Anyone wanna follow that up? Sure. So uh, I'll follow that up. Uh, what I would suggest is I don't have a specific application. Where I find analytics the most objectionable and problematic is that when they are deterministic, that the math in and of itself makes a decision about you or your destiny. Um, I, I believe that it's a best practice 
always, always to have human judgment um, based on an informed decision, whether it's quantitative analysis or there's qualitative data. Um, humans need to make the final determination on whatever the particular question is. I, the clients that I deal with, especially in government, wrestle and struggle with this question on a daily basis. Data cannot be your destiny. Um, and the, the algorithms cannot be deterministic. That is where people get into the biggest trouble is when you take the human element out of the decision-making process. So Ron, I'll, I'll give you my example for the, the unambiguous uh, wrong use of technology by, by a government and that I typically use. It's in China, the idea that you can take a face image and predict whether or not a person is a member of an ethnic minority, the Uyghurs, and track anyone among the Uyghur minority, wherever they go in the country. Mm. It just has the immediate feel of sinister potential. And I think that in the West, we would react badly to that sort of thing. Thanks, Kevin. Genevieve or Salone, anything to add? I'll just mention, because uh, Sarah did not, that the Future Privacy Forum actually has a document from a number of years ago that provides a kind of survey of algorithmic harms. Um, it's a very brief document. I think it's like three or four pages, but it's wonderful. It kind of identifies the many areas where these tools have been adopted and the normative values at stake, at stake in each of them. So I encourage folks to, to take a look. Thank you. I, if I could jump in, this is Kathy again. Um, I will tell you what keeps me up at night. Um, it's the it's the coming wave of people applying for jobs online uh, because I don't think that this it's called sourcing. Um, there's just the matchmaking that's happening online where people who are seeking jobs go to platforms. Those platforms match make with employers looking for workers. There is, <coughs> to my knowledge, no auditing of those matchmaking algorithms. And I think they are probably really problematic. And I just think with all the people out of work right now and looking for work soon, um, this is gonna have an enormous algorithmic effect, a uh, harmful effect on people, on society. Thanks, Thanks Kathy. Sarah, did you have something to add? I, th I thought you were starting to speak. Yeah, I was just going to follow up just something that Solon said. Thanks for bringing that in. We also have a new document out on um, 10 questions on AI risk and are working with a couple of different firms in order to be able to map, to understand how to best capture risks from algorithms, um, whether or not in the context of um, government or in other applications, just a way to begin thinking through all of this. Fantastic. Um, any last words? If not, I think it's probably time to uh, wrap the panel up. I'd like to thank you all for participating. This has been a, a wonderful conversation. Um, I believe now we're going to take a uh, short break before we uh, then switch over to the second panel. So again, thank, thank you all very much. Much appreciated. Thank you all. It's great to be with you, you electronically. Thank Bye, everyone. You guys.